What's oh, up, everybody? Oh, oh, shit. Oh, God damn it. Oops. <laughs> Don't oh, no. try again. All right, take two. Action. All right, what up, everybody? Welcome to Endgame. Today we're going to be talking about the future and stuff. It's me, your host, everybody. Triple Goose. Yep. Dude, you lost the energy yeah, after that first take because you got teleported. Yeah, I, think I, I know, take I know. I, take I messed three. up. What's up, everybody? It's me, Double Goose. Welcome to the VR chat and end game. Yeah, then you want to cheer and shit. <laughs> oh, yes. It's me, Triple Goose. Zip it up. That's uh, No Mo No and the Catapult and Popolopo. And today we're going to be talking about the future where it takes us. Yay. Zip. It's going to like, this is not the real double game. Yeah, yeah. yeah. All right, so welcome to Endgame, where we're going to talk about sort of the... You know, we never talk about what the title means. Endgame is about the endgame of humanity, right? It's about, like, what the plan should be as we head into the final phase here. Um, and today we're going to talk about the ways that we've already changed a whole lot through technology. And I'm going to hope... I hope that I'm going to hear anecdotes from a lot of people in the room. But before we get started with the main topic, we're going to... Check in with the community spotlight on. Oh, you're no longer triple goose. Shikari, please come to the middle and, and tell us uh, how do you see the future going? Well, in terms of uh, virtual reality, we're right now just in the Atari days. You know, we're just now starting off, but I think we're going to get really, mm. really good in the future. Let's see here. In terms of, uh, uh, in many ways, uh, for like uh, environment wise, I live in Michigan right now. It's only, it's like November right now, but for some reason, uh it's only raining you know i thought it'd be snowing by now but apparently not it's kind of weird seeing only rain in november the weather is acting really weird especially with those hurricanes that just happened you know but hopefully that won't happen again later this year you know what i mean so we're when it comes to vr we're in the early days but obviously mm -hmm. you know our environment is changing are we gonna make it to see where we're not in the early days anymore yeah, of course. Uh, I think maybe maybe when we get older and we're probably like maybe in our 50s, maybe something cool might happen like like sort on online style, like virtual reality where we lay on our beds and we go into this world and we can like eat and stuff. That would be really cool. Um, so let's assume that through technology or something, uh, the climate doesn't become a huge problem and we, we overcome that and and civilization survives for another hundred years. What's get, what? What will life look like outside of VR? What's that guy's name that does uh, the rockets? He does the Musk? Tesla cars and everything. Yeah, Elon Musk. Uh, what he's been doing lately is that he's made it a way so that you can travel underground into these tunnels that send you literally hundreds of miles to wherever your destination is. And he wants to make is them the earthquake proof as well. I think that's what company. it is. Isn't that Hyperloop only for Tesla? Like for just Tesla cars alone and not anything else? I'm pretty sure. Oh, I hadn't heard that. I didn't. Well, I last saw the concept video. It was like a parking spot you'd park in and it would take mm -hmm. you down and then just shoot you across. But I'm pretty sure that was oh, that's it. just for that's Tesla one. cars to begin oh. with. Because you can't just fit every car in it or else you're going to kill a bunch of people <laughs> because they're going to try yeah. to put pickup trucks in there. So I think it's as it stands just for Tesla cars. And then once we get all this stuff worked out. Yeah, proof of concept, cars. I would think. I mean, I'm sure something like that might happen for Tesla. And then once they, you know, get more and more, in, you know, uh, get all the bugs worked out or something, they'll be able to put a Ford truck in there somewhere, you know, maybe a Hummer. Yeah. So you're also, just excited about a series of tubes under the ground that we're going to be traveling through. <laughs> Pretty much. Well, <laughs> kind of exciting. well, do you think maybe um, cybernetics might also be like a really big, cool thing? Like, um there's uh, that one guy with the robotic arm that literally works most of the time. It's really heavy for him to wear, but it does work. Um, yeah, I forgot what his name show? was. Big boss. I forgot what his name was. But yeah, like a big <laughs> boss type deal. Literally, like that's what the whole like thing was about. They used a lot of uh, Metal Gear Solid references for the. Vi I think it was Vice that did it, but they covered it, and apparently it's a machine that's going to be working. There's. There's like a micro, like little tiny microchips that can be inside your finger. Where if you get lost, somehow the cops can find you because of that little microchip. Like this, this is like a recent thing that's been going on. So, 
shit's going to get really cool, especially, you know, if someone goes missing, oh, the cops can just kind of find you in the database. Oh, there's a live feed right there. Let's go get him. He's he's out in the middle of the forest somewhere just partying by himself, you know? I saw an exclamation uh, point from over it was, here. There was like this doctor that <laughs> wanted to translate his head mm. on another body or something like that. That is true, yeah. yeah. Are we talking about the guy who wanted to get a head transplant? Or are we talking about, about the guy that looks like a doctor yeah. from... Yeah, they canceled that because the guy is like, he he just backed out. I guess. Too yeah. much pressure. I can't yeah. imagine why. Hey, I can't imagine why. Yeah, it's pretty it's true. stupid. The future is really, really. It's it. There's too many variables. There's too many variables to think what's going to happen. I think even if you give an AI that question, it, an artificial intelligence, it probably might not even be able to tell you. It might be like, well, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that, and I don't know much enough information about human beings and stuff to tell you about that you know or worse yet give an answer that humans just can't comprehend my or heads i think there's so many unforeseen consequences like that's the problem we, we don't know how the dominoes are going to fall right like if there's so mm-hmm. much chaos in the system and that's sort of transitions into what we're going to talk about today right because i think some of the stuff we're going to talk about i don't think people saw the major changes that were going to happen the way people will start acting differently with like social media or whatever advancement that happened like you could make a prediction even 10 years ago and you would be completely wrong today right like it it would be really hard to predict how things were going to shift and i think that probably everything we say in here about making a guess for 100 years from now we are probably all completely wrong right like i can't imagine anyone's nailed it really it's nice it's nice to talk about this kind of stuff yeah all right well thank you and hopefully we'll see you there in 100 years oh yeah definitely Okay, so let, let's get into the main topic. Let's talk no, about the ways yeah. that really don't. different technologies yeah. have sort of really changed us. And I'm kind of looking for our personal stories or our own observations. And we're going to start with uh, our guest, Catapult, today. Catapult, um, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Uh, I'm 58, going to be 59 soon. Uh, my earliest recollection is black and white TV before color TV. And now you're here in VR. I mean... Yeah, that is quite a progression from uh, from that yep. technology to this one. Have you always kind of been like on the cutting edge of where technology is? Like, I, I've been in computers a long time. Actually, computer wise, I started off with the Atari Twenty Six Hundred, which ah. was basically a game system. And then uh, once once I moved out west, started working where I was making a decent wage. Then I got into computers. My first computer was a Commodore VIC Twenty. This thing had three point five. K of RAM. Oh yeah, it was just like wow. But at the time, it was quite phenomenal. Um, uh, yeah. You know, and then pro- progressed up through the Ataris, the you know, so on and so forth, the the Amigas, the Atari STs, and then into PCs and more PCs and more PCs. I never did get into the Mac. I just, hmm. I, I don't know. I did have Apple IIs, Apple II clones, actually, but um, got into uh, TRS-80s um, for running bulletin boards uh, systems uh, at a whopping 300 baud. Uh, 300 baud is, I'm a slow reader, and the text would scroll across the screen just <laughs> a little quicker than I can read. This might be, like, a like, tough question, but, like, do you recognize any way that you've changed like through getting those computers i don't know it, it whether i changed or not or it changed me i wouldn't know because i never went without it kind of thing yeah um it, it's kind of like i've always been curious about the the technology home computers and all that but i have seen things where the certain directions it's going in that scare me that i really don't like certain things that some of these corporations microsoft being one of them do like windows 10 is the biggest piece of spyware on the planet uh you know unless you know how to turn all that stuff off watching it all evolve is just mind-blowing i mean and and vr getting in the vr my first time i put i bought a, a, a chinese a cheap chinese headset and i put this thing on i started looking around i was just blown away I, I I just yelled at my wife, Deb, you got to come and try this thing. You just got to. It's going to blow your mind. You said you started with the Pimax 4K? I had that for roughly three weeks to a month, and I ordered um, uh, HTC Vive. Yeah. So, like, you've sort of really gone through, like, the beginning of computing all the way to where we're 
basically inside the computer. Almost the beginning of home computing. I'd say home computing probably started about three, four years before I got into it. I got into it in about 82, 83, roughly, when the VIC-20 came out. So wait, you were kind of ahead of people, right? Like you were getting your home computer before maybe mainstream. Oh, yeah. And the uh, the downside to that, of course, as soon as people find out you got a home computer, you become the local expert. Like at work, everybody and their dog was coming up to me and say, hey, can I do this with a thing like that? Can I do that? Can I do this? Can I do that? Oh, and, you know, and... and 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 stuff like that. And then once other people started buying these things, then next thing you know, they're coming to me. The thing keeps crashing. What do I do? Turning it on and off again. <laughs> <laughs> Have you tried hitting on the side? Um, before we get more into like the newer technologies, I'm curious. So so you mentioned that color TV was like a big deal. Um, what are what other technologies from your childhood or early years do you remember as being like a big shift in the way things worked? Hey. Cable TV. Oh, really? Okay. Oh, yeah, because uh, when we uh, when I used to watch um, with my dad, black and white TV with the rabbit ears, we only had the four or five local stations, and okay, I'd be right. the remote. I'd be the remote. He'd say, go change the channel, you know? <laughs> so <laughs> then all of a sudden, you know, we got cable. So holy cow, now we got like 13 channels or whatever because you still had the dial thing. They didn't have, you know, a, a remote with a bunch of numbers or a um, touchpad on. Uh, oh, in the 60s. I, I didn't know. I uh, guess I didn't even know cable was that old. Some places in the world probably already had it. Um, mm -hmm. Europe's always, I believe Europe's always been ahead. They actually have a totally different uh, TV signal. They got a PAL system where we got NTCS or whatever it's called. Their signal is actually uh, superior, better quality. And then uh, as things, even appliances, like a washer and a dryer. Whoa. Because I remember my mother having this big wash, round wash tub thing, and it had that ringer. It, it didn't do the spin dry. In the washer, it would just jiggle around and mix the soap in with your clothes and that. And then you would pull it out, pull the clothes out, put it through these two rollers, and then crank it. And that would squeeze all the water out and break buttons and so on and so forth. And then you'd go hang your clothes outside. When the washer with a spin dry and a dryer came out, that was just freaking amazing. Yeah, I guess the convenience I, shift was probably pretty oh, big. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and the workload got cut by, you know, a third or two thirds, actually. It's something we all take for granted now, you know, washer and dryer. Mm -hmm. who, who gives it a second thought? But back then it was like, wow, fireworks, the whole thing. Wow, this is cool. Now, what, what technologies from back then do you think you took for granted then that maybe your parents didn't? Television, because I was born tele black and white television existed. Um Geez, I never actually thought of that. That's a tough one. Do you have an example of that? Automob automobiles. I didn't look that far back. Maybe we didn't live through that exact same time, but we lived through, you know, the boom of the internet and a bunch of that kind of stuff. Well, Our I mean, parents for me, didn't have that. computers were, yeah, computers were, like, I had computers growing up, like, from the time I was 10 years old or so. Like, that was just a component of of my life, like, as far back as I can remember, pretty much. So I know that, like... My experience of the world is definitely different in that way from people who were even just born like a decade or two before me. Like we're talking about a lot of conveniences and that kind of stuff, and that's all really cool. And th there could be downsides to that that we don't see. But there are other things like like TV, I think, is a big one. And the cliche is sort of that like everyone tuned in and checked out and like would watch. I don't know what the average was like a few years ago. I think it was something like five hours of TV a day was like what the average American used to watch. I'm sure that's changed with okay. social media Ooh. a day. That used to be average, which, which, which sounds insane. But I mean, is, if anyone's in desktop mode, could you look up what the average American like used to watch TV like maybe a decade ago before things were like exploding on the internet? Wow. Wait, I would say 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, for TV. The amount of time was phenomenal because that's all people had to do. Um, TV basically okay. replaced uh, radio shows, which okay. were beho before my time and all that. Now, hey, you can actually see pictures. This is cool. It, it, it's like husband would come home, plop his butt on a, a comfy chair and watch TV until and most of the time he fell asleep watching TV. So you're looking at, you know, six to eight hours watching TV. 
And yeah. that's um, not including on days off. On days off, chances are it was like 16 hours a day. Oh, my goodness. It was such a novelty. It was so, so yeah. mind-blowing. And at the time, there was some good shows. You know, there was some really good shows. It wasn't this reality crap that they have nowadays. Mm-hmm. Like, uh, you know, really good comedy shows, Jackie Gleason, uh, Red Skelton, so on and so forth. These were all really, really good shows. Well, the thing that I miss, like when you talk about, like you're talking about like 13 channels and the really good shows, it was much more finite, right? Like now we have 10 million shows on right now and no one can really Most watch. Most of it like, garbage. Most of it's garbage. Yeah, it's We're not all sharing like the same culture anymore. Like it used to be everyone knew the same TV shows because that's all there there was. And so yes. there was something sort of to talk about. Yeah, it'd be kind of like, you know, if you're in the sports and all that and, you know, people go to work and hey, how was the hockey game last night or football game or baseball game or whatever. If you're into that, though, like I'm since I'm not into sports. I don't have anything in common with with my coworkers most of the time because just because like I get all my culture from the internet, so it's all this online pop culture stuff that that most I think like I, I don't know most people I encounter aren't a part of. In real it's going to emerge eventually. Like Echo Arena will t- become the new sport or whatever virtual reality <laughs> esport will take Maybe. over, and that replaces football, and then those two worlds will collide. Did That's you, actually did you started with people simulation. changing. Yes, I'd have to say yes. Um, what was the just uh, if I've uh, noticed people changing, um, especially with the smartphones, as soon as the smartphones came mm-hmm. out is like, it actually scares the crap out of me. I don't know how many times because my, my wife works at Walmart. And when I go pick mm-hmm. her up or drop her off, people will walk out of the store. They got their phone in their face. They walk straight across the, the main, well, the main drag there before you go into the parking lot. They don't look, yep. man. You know, and and how they're not getting hit by vehicles is like blows me away. And they expect everyone else to stop instead of them stopping for yeah. them. Everyone else, it's it is that's crazy. All the time. Yeah, you know, it's it's a, a, um, that's a whole separate rant about, you said the, about the TV a demographic about them. You said sometimes they would watch like sixteen hours a day. So I just checked, and for at least the first quarter of this year, 18 to 24 age range, it was 14 hours a week instead of the average of, like, eight yeah, hours Yeah, did a you day. look it's back like into the 60s? This year? I it's would worth. agree there's less people watching TV now for long periods of time. Well, yeah, but don't forget, in the but 60s and 70s, YouTube that's and all you had. Yeah, 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 yeah we've a... got YouTube. See how yeah, many yeah, no, I was checking, YouTube. and... The majority of that is now just people binge watching uh, like TV shows and stuff on Netflix mm. now. I don't have the attention span for that kind of thing anymore. Like I actually have a hard time sitting down and watching like an hour long episode on Netflix because kind of the culture and the environment I found myself in, which is that there's always like content, all sorts of different content bombarding me all the time. And so like now my attention span, like, like that sounds miserable to to only have like a, a minimal selection and then just like sitting there and watching for hours like that that sounds awful like i i so it's sort of like i completely agree but how much happiness have you gained with all these different options like now that you can consume anything and there's a million choices like do you think you're happier than you would have been i feel pretty good about it i mean i would like my attention span to be better like that i could like focus a little better but like i feel so like when I've got lots of information coming at me from lots of different angles, I feel connected, you know, like I feel like I'm like better aware of what's going on in the world. I'm talking to more people, like interacting with them, with more of them at the same time. Um, so there's definitely that aspect as well. Um, but man, my attention span really isn't great. Do you think you, your attention span has changed over the course of your life? Oh, yeah, definitely. And Whether that has to do with age or not, I don't know. I'm more forgetful now than I ever was. And that might just be because I'm in poor physical condition. Ever since I retired, I haven't been doing a whole heck of a lot other than sitting around the house. But, but you've like, got plenty to do stuff... around the house, right? Because of technology? <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but I'm always sitting in front of a screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but the screen's so full of stuff. <laughs> Wait, you, you don't play, any, you don't do anything active in VR? It's such a great opportunity to sort of get a little bit of exercise and move around. That's what I'm sort of using it for. 
Yeah, the only problem is I have to go downstairs to do that because upstairs I'll end up smashing the fish tank if I start swinging my arms around. Our fish don't have but feelings. If I go downstairs and, 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 and I have a room, <laughs> I end up either uh, coming close to breaking a controller, gouging my walls, or smacking my knuckles. And each time I play VR games, that's exactly what happens. So I avoid those. <laughs> when you were mentioning like how you have this thing, like now you have a ton of stuff coming at you. And you mm -hmm. get to pick and choose. And so, you know, you get to put your attention out there in, in a bunch of different places. And, you know, decades before that, like, you had only a couple of channels. And so I feel like it was more, what would you call that? Like, monolithic? Or, like, th the signal that's but, coming down that's feeding everyone is more... The, what do you I, call I that? never watched TV as a kid either. I mean, like, like Saturday morning cartoons. But I, I read a lot when I was a kid. And that's actually something that I'm not as good at anymore. I could literally sit down and just read a book for three hours straight when I was younger. I definitely can't do that anymore. I have to, like, structure my reading time because I can't just sit there and pay attention to something for that long anymore. That is something that I miss. And, and that isn't monolithic, right? Like, books are definitely, like, there was an enormous variety when I was a kid. And there's been an enormous variety for, for quite a long time. So not everything was monolithic. Except that that's what but I guess I mean the stuff to. that's, like, being sent down the mainstream the stuff that we're trying to like capture the attention of the most people that we can to sell them the, the product or whatever like that is like yeah it was a much more focused uh mainstream i guess like back then and it's yeah. slowly been like widening and, and changing and so like i wonder if if you remember people having like more similar opinions in a way or if like like how is the conversation different because i i feel like people must be different now because you have a million streams of information coming in and now you can have opinions from all over the world. Whereas I imagine my parents just watching TV and sort of giving a very small slice of reality, right? Like their understanding of the world would be very different than like someone that's exposed to a ton of a variety of like information. The thing too, with the internet is the thing with anonymous, what the hell, how do you pronounce that? Word? Can, I, can you say anonymous? anonymous. <laughs> Excuse me. But the, and the, ah, thank you. <laughs> the thing is, you're, you're hiding behind a screen, right? So basically, you can say anything you want without any recourse. So people will get on there on whatever form of social media and whatnot, and they'll either decide to be a nice person, uh, be respectable or whatever, or be a total dick. So it, it depends on who you try to portray yourself as your online persona. In a way, that changes people because some people get to the point where they uh, look at their online persona and real life, and all of a sudden, a little bit of their own online persona might start showing up in their real life habits, kind of thing. I feel like um, that's more how like, they behave. It change change people's characters, though, right? Like it, it's it kind of describes their character. So like, if you're the kind of person who goes online and you're, and you're mean to people because you can get away with it, like that your, your character, like the, like kind of who you are is just, you're just kind of a different type of person than a person who goes online and is kind to people, uh, even without uh, having like negative consequences for not doing that. But like that, the internet didn't make them that way, right? They, they kind of had that inclination to begin with. But probably never shown it in real life, or else they get their right. butts kicked. But the <laughs> yeah, thing, so but the thing, the, the thing, the thing that's really cool, though, the, the really positive thing is, you take some people that are shy to a fault in real life, and they'll come into something like this, or even um, is something that we I used to use called IRC Internet Relay Chat, which was mm -hmm. just typing, but it was social, um, and they'll go go in there, and all of a sudden. There's no reason to be shy here. Nobody yeah, can see me or neat. whatever. Yeah. And all of a sudden, they they find out that they got a fantastic sense of humor. They're great friggin' people. They're just too shy in real life to come out of their shell and let some of that be shown. You know. I'm old. Well, let's go back to like I... whoever you are. Come up. I can't hear you. Hey, it's Ron. Hey, Ron. Hey, uh, just briefly, I was going to say I'm old. I'm almost forty-seven. I've also seen quite a lot of transitions. And one of the things with communication uh i started in the video game industry because i ran a 24-line bbs we used to meet in real life and that has changed from that to aol i watched everyone use aol and of course the nerds used irc but 
that fundamentally was what I feel like is almost, this is almost a reproduction of that same cycle in VR chat. That is actually interesting how these social patterns will iterate with new technologies. Yeah, I ran a BBS also, Ron, not quite as fancy as yours with the 24 lines. I only had the one line. But I went from 300 baud to 1200 once 1200 came out. And I went and spent $800 for a real Hayes 1200 baud, and I got it at cost. The lady at the computer shop said, you run that bulletin board, don't you? I said, yeah. Said, I'll let you have this thing at cost. It was $1,200 price tag, a dollar a baud. And she let me have it for a cost at 800 bucks. She said, I give you a deal on this, and I'm going to make a fortune on all the people that are buying modems to go call into your bulletin board. <laughs> oh, what is a baud? Uh, it, it was a measurement of speed kind of thing. Oh, okay. Um, okay. So let's see, 1200 baud would be, I think, 1.2K a second oh, okay. or something like that. Right. Very swift. All right, cool. <laughs> and it was unreal. 1200 baud was unreal, man. The screen yeah. would fill up like at the blink of an eye. And now we're looking at this, now I'm running 150 megabits a second. Uh, they've done like marketing studies on like how fast a web page has to respond in order for people to feel like their time isn't being wasted. And nowadays it's something ridiculous. Like it's like 140 microseconds or something. Like it's really, yeah. like it's a really, really small number. Like the expectations of people you know, has definitely changed. Like they expect responsiveness, like kind of we do from VR, like, right? Because we want to simulate real life and and so it has to be really responsive it has to be uh you know it has to be and that's just a function of the things you're mentioning before about attention span there was a thing um, with atms they studied where people were the atms were really blindingly fast and people were still getting irritated that their money wasn't coming out quick enough yeah. We get to expect more and more. I mean, because like in real life, when we interact with objects, like it's instantaneous. When we can move anything with our limbs, like as soon as we want to make it happen, we can make it happen. And I think probably we just inherently, like as technology gets better, we want more and more of that from our devices. That actually feeds into addiction personality. Um, people that want instant yeah. gratification. And technology mm -hmm. is raising a lot of people with instant gratification expectations. So I'm wondering if technology is also basically enabling more addicts or, or, or stirring that up a little bit more. I probably could say that I'm addicted to the internet, maybe. But before that, like I said, I was addicted to books. And like, how, how unhealthy is that sort of thing, depending on you know, your lifestyle, I guess? It, it, it depends on the people, uh, the individual person. There's, there's people that can turn the thing off. And go outside and go for a jog or, you know, go do some physical activity. Especially people that work in offices because they're not getting any physical activity whatsoever. Where I was uh, basically a geek when I was at home, but I, I worked a um, uh, physical job. So I basically did all my physical activity at work. Mm -hmm. And then when I'd get home, is like I'd veg out and sit in front of the screen and play games and... You know, once I got the internet, because I didn't always have the internet, and so on and so forth. Once, yeah, once I got the internet, that was that opened up a whole new thing. Man, I'm finally fixed, and I feel like we've moved past the thing I wanted to talk about. Like, uh, I wonder how we could take a serve. Like, like when the internet was so shitty. Like, I wonder how long most people in here have waited for a pornographic image to load like what's the longest amount of time they've waited just for like one jpeg to load because like there are a lot of young Probably people here who don't even know <laughs> yeah like they don't understand that like to them it's instant it's in their snapchat they click on something and there's porn immediately but man mom would pick up, mom would pick up the phone in the other room and disconnect the signal <laughs> and you get half of a picture <laughs> right. You have to be really <laughs> patient. I that. I that. No, no, don't forget. At the time, the images, the resolution was so low, it, it, it would take, I don't know, maybe a couple of minutes or so, depending on if it was 300 or 1200 baud. But I remember it was an add on card for the Atari ST, and you could plug in your TV th uh, cable through it, and, and it was a pass through to your uh, TV, and you could actually click the mouse and take pictures of what was happening on TV. Oh, now, so the like a screenshot, basically. Yeah, basically a screenshot. <laughs> but it, 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 the problem is 
everything had a red tint. It was like black and white, but instead of being black, it was red. Oh, and mm. man, it was ugly. But this friggin' thing was, you know, cutting edge at the time. And it was like $200 for this piece of crap. What by today's standards would be called a piece of crap. It's the same thing with the voice thing. Uh, um, Vo uh, Votrix, I think it was called, where you would type command, you would type stuff on the keyboard and it would pronounce it. But you had to type phonetically or else it would like, what the hell did it just say? Me and my friend, we sat there and we laughed all night just by typing stupid crap in the, on the keyboard. And I just typed, go fuck a duck. And it, it said, go <laughs> fuck a duke. <laughs> so, so basically, I had to put some H's in there. F-H-U-K. And, and so on and so forth. And then I pronounced it properly. But that's pretty good for preliminary like voice technology like that. I'm curious, um, like from the audience, if there's a technology that we haven't talked right. about before that you remember from when you were young that kind of changed your world or your perception of the world. Do you guys have any other examples? I, I'm actually, a, my birthday today, I'm a little older than you. I'm, I, I had an Atari ST, I had a TI, I had the whole nine yards, very much into 3D and graphics. So I remember mm -hmm. distinctly, I believe it was sixth grade, before the internet, your parents, they could afford it, would get you the World Book Encyclopedia, right? So you had the big collection. Oh, yeah. Encyclopedia salesmen would go door to door. It was a big hustle. It might be hundreds of dollars to have that so your kid could be educated, right? There would be a yearly thing, an update of all the latest, newest things. So this goes back to about sixth grade. I think this was in the late 60s, believe it or not. This might have been 68, 69 update. I opened it up, and there was a red filter thing on a, a cardboard frame. And then there was this sort of blank frame, and I put them together, and I taped them and put it up. Then maybe you guess what you do or not. I took a flashlight and a covered cardboard, punched a pinhole in it, and that was my first hologram. And what they did, it was, oh. I think, made in Russia or something. It was a chess set, and you looked through there, and it was fully dimensional. And I took it to class. This is like, this is like Star Trek or something. You were looking into this window. And it was real because it would move. Just like VR today, yeah. you see. Yeah. And oh, that was cool. one of my first mind-blowing things. Since then, my, my angle has been more like 3D computers and graphics. So I recall about 20 years ago, I would go to national 3D conventions. This is the National Stereographic Association, NSA. And back then, this is back in the 90s, they had some of this, these big headsets you'd put on for VR. But these things were like panoramic 3D on film, and it was two strips of film over and under. And as you turned your head, there was a gyro and all this stuff, and it really kind of half-assed. But you could look around like this, and you would see things in 3D and panoramic. But that was like Vanguard. I said, that's what you want. You want more reality, more immersion, you see. Uh, tomorrow night, I'm going to go to an old 3D club meeting in D.C., and it's guys in their 70s mm -hmm. and 80s, and I, I took my gear VR. Look in here, man. Look look at VR. And some some people are like, cool. And some old guys are like, get it away. It's like a cross to a vampire. You know? <laughs> they want to do things <laughs> in the room, you know. So I'm trying to get my 3D right. friends, come along. We'll meet in this room virtually and check all, all our work from around the world, you know, like we used to do a long time ago. But uh, if I could make a room in here that had three-dimensional projection you know, slides and still. I think the new hub has yeah, like three. Yeah, there's, there's stereoscopic projection now in VR oh, Chat. It's kind of a recent hub. update. But yeah, it's it's like baby steps for them. You know, it's just like I said, I'm like the um, I'm like the Timothy Leary that you. Know, I said you got to try this. You got to try your advice. No, no, it's weird because <laughs> it's just what they said about TV. You know, people with attention difficulties and there's deficits, which I'm somewhat guilty. Spend an inordinate amount of time on television with television years ago. They made this correlation. So I can only imagine with the web. And YouTube and everything like now, it's going to accelerate because it's instant gratification. You see, you can just pop anything. I remember, you may remember years ago, if you love music, you would make special trips to stores in the city to find an LP, you know, like, oh, there's that album, you know, that rock album, yep. that jazz or class. I mean, it was like the hunt was part of the whole thing. Finding even in the 80s a, a video cassette of a movie you remember. You, you can remember black and white TV. There was a movie yeah. on as a kid. He said, man, that's the craziest movie. And you'll never see it again, right? You talk about it or a TV show that came and went. Suddenly there was VHS, you see. And you would go and look for these VHS of things you can remember. And that was the only way you got to see it. Now I can just go to YouTube, look at stuff from, you know, 100 years ago, <laughs> starting with Edison up, you know, movies and stuff. So now that whole aspect of, of the hunt and collecting and going out and, 
finding that thing, you know, like this this whole thing of the collector kind of issues gone because now we have just wonder, instant gratification digitally. Everything, music, I if that video. In the invention of agriculture, like if if the if the older generation was like, oh, these younger people are like keeping their <laughs> animals in cages and just killing them. Where's right. the where's that's, the hunt? Uh, where's the artist? Well, that aspect of music that I think has changed everybody is. When you go and get your ten dollars and you go and buy that album or that cassette, you would go home and you would put it on and you would listen to every track and you would look look in the album and you look at the liner notes. But that also created a culture of metalers and rockers and mods and punks. And it created I mean that sorta is now, but it that really started that whole I mean, all way back to the rockabillies and all those other kind of things. People would listen to a type of music, go to a show or get an album and listen to it and became Part of a culture now i feel like that's kind of less of a culture because what are people just click on a spotify oh, well, tell you more like later but Beatles, it's more of a it's, London, so that's, that's fundamentally ah. changed like everyone listens to everything i mean me i listen to everything now and i'm not really don't really identify with the yeah. type of My, so this is like to me like the punk scene i would go to these underground bars people would dress people would, people dress. would become characters and the goth scenes everybody was in the character and you would go to these crazy little uh, bars and scenes. I would go in the you know, East Coast cities and then people would be doing crazy stuff, you know, and like I come here and I go to the pub and everybody's dressing like they're fancy characters, you know, not many goths or punks and they're doing crazy shit. It's just, it's just like, wow, this is, you wow. know, this is like 30 or 40 like years that ago. It's that whole scene. Yeah. yeah it's, kind of it's there. It's sort of like the punk in the matrix beats Roger Rabbit right now. This is like living the Roger Rabbit movie. Because look at all these, these, cell type animation characters except they're fleshed out which blows my mind i can see the outlines yet they're fully dimensional that's what makes it so incredible to me um what do you mean no puns, so, man uh, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah that's what, what was this that whole album thing cover it was an what album was that? cover that actually had a zipper that was the rolling stone sticky fingers designed by andy okay. warhol so that's yeah, that's that stuff goes all that back. You wouldn't have like that people wouldn't share nowadays because like we don't we don't share as much of the same culture, right? Like I'm not gonna know like some you know the the album art or whatever of of some music that that you're listening to, Namano or something like that. So that's I, I think a big say. part of it is quantity, right? I don't know. That's the the main thing that I, I'm sort of recognizing between all the stuff that we're talking about is that like our attention span has drastically shifted it is harder for you to read a book now. Right. And I think that is, I don't know, significant. Like that's a change in your mind. Like that's a big deal. Yeah. It's actually something like I want to try to exercise because I think it's of value to me to have a a longer attention span, to have that focus available to me. And so, yeah, I definitely think it's not like a, a, a benefit, but, but there are lots of other things that, that I feel like are benefits. It's almost like we got so much to choose from. We just don't know what to choose. I mean, maybe. Yeah, I, I find I, it paralyzing sometimes. Oh, yeah. Well, you go on you, just YouTube yeah. alone. I mean, you, there's so many bloody videos you can play. TV, a hundred and some channels if you got full cable or full satellite. Oh, no, is, there's thousands and, of channels, you know, dude. Okay, so what That's do I want to watch? Right, but the thing about, and you were kind of talking about the hunt earlier, like mm. on YouTube, that's what I experience. Like I go through video after video and I will eventually find something I really like that really like but you didn't drive an hour downtown. Really cool. <laughs> There's psychological studies that have pretty much proposed that having more choices this it does not make you happier. And they've done this with really? games and interactive games. What happens psychologically is that the more choices you have, the more regrets you can have because you realize that you know you've made one finances, marriage, school, and then you had all these others that you overlooked. And then if you have any trouble with choices and later on your home, whatever, then you think back, oh, I should have done this. I should have done that. But that just means someone else is making your decisions for you, which I think in a lot of places can be spiritually stifling. Uh, I mean, but, you know, in one way, that's the trivial things like what you're going to wear and what you know, it's well, the TV, that may not though. be your true source of happiness either way. You know? Like when there's like five it, panels sort of, on, oh, on yeah. TV, like someone else is specifically three making channels. that decision about what media you're going Only to three consume. channels, yeah. Back then, like people had more unity than that. Everyone, like you said, everyone saw the same show. So the big thing back then was Ed Sullivan. So everyone could watch Ed Sullivan because he'd be an opera singer, they'd be the Beatles, they'd be an acrobat, they'd be a politician. So something for everyone. So everyone tuned in. And saw it because there weren't that many more choices. And so 
aspects of the pop culture of these little sayings and witticisms and, you know, one-liners. Everybody knew those. And now, right now, I come here and I, I don't know all these memes. The character running around, I need healing, I need healing. I go, what's wrong with him? So I had to look that up, meme up. People here are like two generations ahead of me. So now, so much less to relate to. In other words, things when you grow up, like right now, everyone knows who Lady Gaga is. Your grandmother knows who Lady Gaga is, whether she likes it or not. You get two generations later, that was a reference point that people of all ages knew, you see. But once you get two generations, you go, oh, yeah, you're just like Lady Gaga, or he reminds me of Bill Clinton. They're going, who, what, where, when? You have no idea. I thought it was just interesting how you mentioned that having less choices could be better, but then you're saying there should be more choices. It's kind of like, what? where's the middle ground? Part of my bias is that I studied biology in college, and in ecology, uh, the concept of biodiversity is actually very important, and it's kind of a defining principle of an environment. When you have an environment that has a lot of diversity, that has a lot of different things going on, a lot of different activity, a lot of different types of interacting parts, uh, that's what biodiversity is, and you have a healthier uh, natural environment because of it. And that's kind of the the thing that our, our, our planet is kind of... Uh, declining in right now. We're getting less and less biodiversity over time, but I feel like we can have a cultural biodiversity as well, where it's not just a small group of people determining what specific media you're going to consume or what specific opinions you're going to be exposed to. The, the, like the, the more diverse an environment is, the more it can uh, potentially produce and the more it can grow and flourish. That's kind of my take on it. Um, but also, like, I, I didn't experience that type of unity. Um, I, I pretty much had the Internet my entire life. And, and like, that's just been my uh, my experience. So I, so I don't know anything different, but um, it feels healthy to me to have to have a diverse environment where people aren't being told what to think, essentially. As a music creator, uh, when I was younger, I had like a guitar and I had one keyboard in a Porta studio and I made more music then than I ever did. And now when I have terabytes of sample files and kick drums and BST synthesizers and stuff. And it's just a known thing in the production community when people have access to too many things. That's one thing I want to say that's changed te technology wise. It's good sometimes for creative people anyway, to limit your options. It's actually impacted me. I've forced myself to limit myself down to things so technology almost having everything at your fingertips can be like someone said before i think nomino said it's paralyzing i used to be a drummer and uh i ended up getting some electronic drums i just sold them off i did not like electronic drums they did some amazing things you could do some amazing things with them but i just couldn't get the feel acoustic drums when you hit them you actually feel it in your gut when you hit the bass drum the low um floor toms uh, the way they're tuned, you feel it. When you hit a cymbal, you you feel it vibrate in the air and all this. You couldn't get that off electronic drums. I hated electronic drums. I miss acoustic drums. Same with me. I like acoustical stuff, but I, I like just, I don't mind. I don't, it doesn't have to be physically usable necessarily, although I do like that feeling. Um, I, I don't mind it being digital as long as the choices are less. I think for me, the problem has just been too many too, access to too much stuff and then I, I sit down to create and i like have infinite possibilities and so i kind of get paralyzed as in a little it's hard to explain like that's how i feel yeah i experience that a lot so i think that where we're going right the trajectory is in the favor of diversity right like now any asshole can have a youtube show a bug and a robot <laughs> and we can <laughs> we just put it up there and like it doesn't have to be it's not monolithic right it's it's really anyone can do it and at the same time, like, while I know that's a good thing that we're not being told how to think and now everyone can theoretically have a voice, what comes with that is just a seemingly infinite amount of choice. And we're not necessarily built for that, right? Like, we've evolved for a very long time without having infinite choice, right? Like, we've been, right. We've been moving slowly. You mentioned agriculture. Like, we were moving so slowly for so long. This thing that we're talking about has happened just in a few decades. Like the, the amount of choice that a human has in a, in a single lifetime has just exponentially soared just in a few decades. Uh, yeah, I mean, I agree. And so, I mean, but I think the solution there might be, uh, like Ron mentioned, as an artist, you learn to constrain yourself. You learn to make your own choices about what you're going, you know, what direction you're going to go into. So that you're not you're not by bombarded by just chaos all the time. There's a there's a specific structure you can uh, you can give yourself and and like have that have that control. I guess 
I think that's difficult. Like if you're an artist and you're really, and you can structure and have a plan and like, you can really make that happen and be disciplined, but it's happening to everyone. Right. And like we, so we all have to be disciplined in a way. And I don't know if we're being instructed in a good way of how to deal with all these choices, right? Like what we're being instructed to do is consume as much as possible. Like look over here, look over here, look over here. That's what everybody's trying to do. No one's trying to tell you, all right, slow down, focus, just do one thing. Like, you know, I don't know. Right. We need but, more people like taking up that. Well, my experience of the UK, I grew up in the UK and used to go to one little tiny store to get food. And I moved to the U S and we went, I remember going to Toys R Us as opposed to like a little tiny toy shop or a Safeway, which to me was insane compared to this little grocery store that I used to go to as a kid. And so I've experienced almost like a, a jump in choice coming to America, million TV channels, million things to buy at the store, Million, this is before this is in the 80s this is before even the internet were you a million times happier because you had all those choices as a kid i thought i was uh, in the toy store <laughs> but as I, I like i was like wow look at all this cool stuff and i do like america like when i went i actually went back to england for two years in 2004 2006 and i felt all of a sudden restricted all of a sudden i had i lost all those choices and it felt really bad it's something that really bummed <sighs> me out like i didn't wasn't able to order stuff online or go to the um, you know, go to these big department stores and get stuff. It was all very limited. And it just all of a sudden felt like I got cut off from that and didn't feel good. Yeah. As I complain about too many choices, paralyzing me, if you took those choices away, I think I would freak out. Right. If, if YouTube went away or whatever, and I had nothing to watch, I wouldn't react to that well either. But I gotta go, I gotta go pick up my wife, but you came up with a perfect title for a show. You know, just another <laughs> asshole with a YouTube show. That's a perfect title for a show right there. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, before you leave, uh, can you come up to the front and can we do a big group picture? I, I think we're, we're done. Yeah. We did it. Gather near the we stage. Do it. Hi, guys. You are going to look towards me. Green shot in yeah, three, two, one. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh, We're done. Goodbye, YouTube. Hello.